So my name is Ken Fujisi, and thank you so much for inviting us. Um, such an honor to be here. So I want to talk to you about uh, acute coronary syndromes. Okay, four easy steps. Only four easy steps. All right. So let's assume that you have successfully completed the uh, cardiology fellowship, and then you are now a, a private cardiologist in a premier institution like this institution. And of course, you have to take a call, and you are on call. And guess what? Your beeper just went off. Woo. So, um, you know, emergency room doctor is calling you in a very anxious voice. Hey, um, uh, Dr. So and so, Mr. West is a 71 year old male with hypertension. He just came to the emergency room with very typical chest pain. And then you run down to the emergency room and do a quick physical examination showing blood pressure 116, heart rate 105, respiration 18, and you hear by baseline crackles and there are F3 gaps and JVD. EKG shows ST depression in 2-3 AVF. And then troponin is positive and creatinine is 1.1. So your beeper just went off. It sounds like ACS, isn't it? It's not a STEMI. All right, it's not a non-cardiac chest pain patient. So what would you do? So that's the thing. I recommend you to remember three clinical trials. Number one, Timax clinical trial. Number two, GRACE ACS risk stratification model. Number three, Matrix clinical trial. And this is my uh, four easy steps for ACS, just for you guys. Number one, diagnose it, excluding STEMI and non-cardiac chest pain. Number two, graciously risk stratify, keeping Timax in mind. Number three, cool them down with maximum medical therapy. And number four, cut them next morning, bearing metrics in mind. All right, kind of cryptic uh, language. Now, so acute coronary syndrome is a major cause of emergency room visit and hospitalization in this country. And 1.6 million hospitalizations occur for ACS. 1.2 million for ACS and 0.3 for STEMI. 22% of death occur due to ACS within 24 hours of hospitalization. So we have to be careful. And of course, ACS is due to plaque rupture and in some rare occasions, um, plaque erosion. And this is the OCT showing right here plaque rupture and thrombs formation. So, how do you diagnose ACS? Of course, you have to assess uh, risk factors. Male smoking, diabetes, CKD, PAD, hypertension, CAD, LDL. Those are the risk factors you have to remember. And of course, you have to take careful history, paying special attention to the nature of the chest pain, and classify the chest pain into typical angina, atypical angina, or non-angina chest pain. And of course, you have to do a quick, focused physical examination, paying attention to blood pressure, heart rate, and signs of heart failure. And of course, EKG, you have to look for ST segment deviation. And cardiac troponin, very important. So out of those, you know, the, the components, EKG and cardiac troponins are um, two most important uh, the uh, medical pieces of information. So let's um, recap uh, uh, this portion of the talk. Chest pain and rest, you have to exclude STEMI. If this happens to be STEMI, as Dr. Gilani talked about, activate the cath off. Now, if this is not a um, ACS, non-cardiac non chest pain, just refer them to an outpatient stress test, and then reach the diagnosis of ACS. So what the next step? Step number two, graciously risk stratify, keeping Timax in mind. What is this? Why risk stratification ever necessary? Because high-risk patients suffer <coughs> adverse cardiac outcomes unless they undergo cardiac catheterization and PCI procedure within 24 hours according to the TIMAX clinical trial. How do you risk stratify ACS patients? You can effectively risk stratify ACS patients using the GRACE score, all right? What is a TIMAX study? The TIMAX study is a clinical trial where 3,000 plus ACS patients are randomized to routine early invasive strategy or delayed invasive strategy. And primary outcome consisted of death MI CVA and secondary outcome, death MI and refractory ischemia. Specific hypothesis was tested, meaning that the early invasive strategy is better than delayed invasive strategy 
and the result was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2009. Why was a TIMAC study needed to be performed? Because back then, a group of cardiologists believed that the PCI was safer when performed after prolonged antiplatelet and antianthropine therapy. So there's a group of doctors who believed it is safer to perform PCI, cath PCI procedures after decreasing thrombus burden and passivating unstable plaque. But the other group of doctors said, no, it is safer to perform cath PCI right away to stabilize the ruptured and unstable coronal lesions. So that's Timex study. And, here, and then how was the Timex study performed? They randomized unstable angina and non stemming patients one to one to early intervention or delayed intervention and standard medical therapy was given to both groups. And at six months, they measured primary and secondary outcomes consisting of death, MI, stroke for primary outcomes, and death, MI, and refractory ischemia for secondary outcomes. Here's the data. Data showed high-grade score patients, early invasive strategy was highly effective. Low to intermediate grade score patients early and delayed invasive strategy were equally effective. All right, so what does it mean? If your patient has grade score 141 or higher, bring them to the cath lab within 24 hours. If your patient happened to have grade score 140 or lower, you can wait, do the cath and PCI procedure during the hospitalization. What is a grade score? Grade score tells us how likely it is the patient of yours to die during the hospitalization. Serious parameter. And GRACE was developed based on a multinational registry of 11,000 plus ACS patients, all right? And requires eight pieces of clinical information for calculation. And calculated by assigning a point to each variable based on the degree of its contribution to mortality. And this GRACE score has been extensively verified and cut off, you have to rem remember, today is 141. All right, how do I calculate the grade score, Dr. Fujisi? The grade score is calculated by entering eight pieces of information to the form available at the website, all right, or a smartphone if you happen to have uh, downloaded uh, the apps, all right? So this is how screenshot looks, age, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, creatinine, heart failure, one, two, three, and you hit the button, display score, and you pay only attention to here, in hospital death, all right? Please notice that the troponin, uh, positivity or negativity per se, wouldn't allow you to fully risk stratify your patients, all right? What is the implication for today's practice? All right, ACS patients, if patients are having chest pain in front of you, hey, activate the cath valve, just like STEMI, Cath within 20, you know, two hours. If the patient uh, can be stabilized, calculate uh, grade score 141 or higher. Go ahead and do a cardiac catheterization next day. If 140 or lower, cath before discharge. All right. So in Mr. West case, turns out grade score is 207. That that is associated with mortality rate of 18 percent. Very high. Death MI 30 percent. So obviously, Mr. West belongs to the uh, high-risk category of patients. Therefore, clear strategy is the early invasive strategy to, to perform cath PCI within 24 hours. And this strategy, according to the TIMAX study, can potentially decrease the risk of refractory ischemia by 70%, 70%. All right, what would you do after, you know, the, the arranging cardiac catheterization next morning? cool them down with maximum medical therapy, all right? So you've got just about 16 to 24 hours until next morning, cardiac catheterization. What would you do, all right? You have to do DAPT, um, 81 to 162 milligrams of aspirin, and talcagorilla or similar uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. 
No GPI based on early ACS clinical trial that showed no benefit of early GPI administration, and also antithrombin, bival, or heparin are equally acceptable. Non fundopranox uh, that is associated with uh, catheter thrombosis, nitrate, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, statins, and morphine for pain control are all useful. And don't forget to discontinue non steroidal anti inflammatory medication or COX 2 inhibitors. All right, then you have to cath them next morning bearing matrix in mind. What does it mean? All right, when you take the patient to the cath lab, 80% of the time, you're gonna see a lesion that is amenable to PCI. Only 5% requires cabbage, 15% you cannot identify impact related lesion, therefore medical therapy, all right? So what is a matrix clinical trial? What is it? And why that needed to be performed? Because we didn't know the idea access and antithrombin for PCI or ACS patients, all right? The matrix is a clinical trial to test two discrete hypotheses in ACS patients. Number one, transradial approach is better than transfemoral approach. Hypothesis number one. Number two, bival is better than heparin. Hypothesis number two. And the matrix examines all four possible combination in a metric fashion, like this, all right? How was a matrix trial conducted? Easy. Non STEMI STEMI patients, 8,400 patients were randomized one to one to transradial intervention versus transfemoral intervention. This portion is called the access program. And then those patients are taken to the cath lab, an angiogram done, and they decided whether or not the patient needed the PCI. If PC PCIs were not needed, those patients were followed up on medical therapy for 30 days for MACE and NACE. If those patients under, underwent PCIs, then those patients were randomized one-to-one -one between bival and heparin. And this portion of the, the randomization is called the antithrombin program. And those patients were also followed up for 30 days for MACE and ACE. What did a matrix trial show? All right, here's the data. In terms of access site, transradial is better or femoral is better. All right, this is the data. Transradial intervention on ACS patients led to better MACE and NACE, all right? Better MACE in TRI or transradial intervention is driven by lower rates of all-cause death and non stemming as you guys can see here on this slide. And also better NACE in transradial intervention is driven by lower access site bleeding rate, all right? So clear winner here was transradial approach. How about antithrombin program comparing bival and heparin? Here's the data. Bival didn't reduce MACE or NACE. Bival treatment was associated, however, with reduction in all-cause mortality driven by cardiovascular death. Also, reduction in bleeding, fetal bleeding and no access site bleeding. Increase in stent thrombosis was noted with bival treatment. So overall winner appears to be bival over heparin. What does the matrix trial teach us? All right, for ACS patients, transradial approach using bival would lead to the best possible outcome. Controversial, but this, this is what this data appears to indicate. Why is that? Transradial intervention leads to access site bleeding reduction, and bleeding is associated always with mortality. All right, by values would decrease non access site bleed, therefore, decreases mortality as well. So, this is the same patient, Mr. West, uh, after stent deployment, and I noticed that we did it uh, from transradial approach using by So, you are on call, your beeper just went off. Hey, this is not. STEMI. This is not a non cardiac chest pain patient, so therefore, this is ACS. What you want to do? All right, four easy steps for ACS. Number one, diagnose it, excluding STEMI and non cardiac chest pain, the first rule at STEMI. Number two, graciously use the GRACE score risk stratify, keeping TIMAX clinical study in mind. All right, don't forget to calculate GRACE score, cutoff is 141. Number three, cool them down with the maximum medical therapy. 
aspirin type agorilla to decrease and minimize uh, stem thrombosis risk. And number four, cut them next morning, bearing metrics in mind. In my view, best combination could be type agorilla, bival, and trans radar intervention. So with that, thanks so much for your attention.